state of Washington, an energetic workforce is teamed with huge machines, busily fitting the pieces together for the Centralia steam electric generating plant. The project is a massive one, requiring more than $200 million to be invested by utilities in the facilities and construction payrolls and to help assure the future electric power supply. Big in concept, for the development will use a natural resource that had lain dormant for years in the coal fields that will provide fuel. Big in its importance to the region, for here in steel and concrete is the first major step by the electric industry as it moves from a hydroelectric power system to a system utilizing the heat of coal to produce electricity, a demand that is doubling every 10 years. Steam electric generating projects like the Centralia steam plant using coal or oil or nuclear fuel are the only practical answers to meet the responsibility. More than 10 years ago, Pacific Power and Light Company and the Washington Water Power Company began coal field exploration work near Centralia. Geologists proved up millions of tons of coal available by surface mining methods for power plant use. This thick seam, the largest in the Centralia field, is the only coal deposit in the region that can supply low-cost fuel for power generation. The location of the coal field is midway between the major load centers of Washington and Oregon and a short distance from the high-voltage regional transmission grid. The plant site is about five miles northeast of the city of Centralia and adjacent to the coal deposit. Looking ahead to the day when nearly all of the hydro sites would be developed, utility engineers and managers saw in the Centralia coal the fuel supply for a large steam electric plant. Phil Humphreys of Pacific Power and Light Company, Morley Hatch of the Washington Water Power Company, Cliff Erdahl with Tacoma City Light, and George Brunzel, the president of the Washington Water Power. They also knew that environmental aspects of the coal mining operation would be of concern to the public. The sponsors have pledged that as the mining progresses, the Centralia coal field lands will be rehabilitated and the soil returned to productive agricultural or forestry uses. Here is an artist's concept of how the mined over area will be restored as the operation progresses. At the left are larger trees planted after that section was mined and leveled by machines shown at work. The material that covers the coal will be removed by a large bucket wheel excavator and the coal mined with a dragline scoop like this one. The coal reserves are in several seams and vary in thickness from 5 to 50 feet. Before it is burned, the coal will be washed to reduce the amount of ash and other non-combustibles, thus increasing the thermal quality of the fuel. After washing, the coal will be stockpiled outdoors or fed by a conveyor belt system to storage silos located on the plant adjacent to the big boilers. The Skookumchuck River will furnish a water supply for washing the coal, for producing steam, and for use in the plant cooling system. An earth-filled dam will form a reservoir to supply water for the plant, also provide two million gallons daily for the city of Centralia sometime in the future. The utilities in the summer of 1968 start work on the project. Over 1,000 civic, business, and government leaders join industry representatives for a kickoff ceremony. They inspect a model of the future power plant, which will produce as much energy as three plants the size of the Bonneville project. Washington Governor Dan Evans congratulates the companies and predicts the plant will be a showcase of industrial development that also will preserve the state's environmental quality. A group of officials, including Governor Evans, Howard Lane of Portland, who represents Oregon's Governor McCall, and Presidents Don Frisbee of Pacific Power and George Brunzel of Washington Water Power, push electric buttons triggering the first flow of concrete and officially start construction. Soon after, concrete starts to flow daily at the plant site. Carpenters build the farms that will shape the foundation. Big buckets swing into the work area, dumping their heavy loads of cement mix. 
Huge quantities of concrete go into the powerhouse structure. 60,000 cubic yards will be poured during the construction period. Even the temperature of the concrete is critical. It is checked often to make certain that specifications are met. The massive footings then are cured before tons of steel begin rising into the sky for the structure. Meanwhile, a giant power transformer arrives. It will function as the heart of a substation to supply power during construction. Carloads of steel begin to arrive, thousands of tons to be erected in months ahead. The dimensions of the steel girders are impressive. Soon, the first piece of steel is lifted from the stockpile. Workers rig the cable in preparation for the milestone event. And up it goes. A 10-ton hunk of metal standing erect against a blue summer sky. A crane performs the lifting job, but it still takes plenty of brawny muscle to set the beam. Work at the plant goes ahead on many fronts. The sections of pipe will circulate water from the plant to cooling towers. Four pipelines will handle 500,000 gallons of water per minute as it is circulated between the plant and the towers. The water will be used in the condenser cooling system for each 700,000 kilowatt turbine generator unit. As the plant takes shape, another major construction phase gets underway on the Skookumchuck River. Work on the earth fill axis of the Skookumchuck storage dam involves excavating one half million cubic yards of earth and then refilling the cavity and the valley between rock bluffs with more than two million cubic yards of material. The structure will span this valley late in 1970 when the winter runoff will begin to form a reservoir. Biologists from the power companies work with representatives of the state fisheries agencies to ensure that the aquatic environmental values of the river will be preserved, perhaps even improved. The fisheries specialists plan ways for fish to continue to use the stream and the future reservoir. Another research program relating to environmental aspects of the project has been underway for several years on a ridge overlooking the site in the Hannaford Valley. This meteorology station houses sophisticated recording instruments to monitor prevailing air quality and weather characteristics in the vicinity of the site prior to plant operation. The data being recorded includes temperatures, precipitation, wind speed and direction, and the amount of contaminants present in the air. No change in atmospheric conditions is anticipated after the plant is in operation, though. Installation of highly efficient electrostatic precipitators, the largest ever constructed, will remove virtually all of the fly ash after the coal is burned. And concern for the environment enlists a classroom full of members of the Future Farmers of America at Centralia High School. The students are asked to join in an experimental grass seed planting program in the test mining area. The test program is related to the future rehabilitation of mined areas after the coal has been removed. Students planted four mixtures of grasses on a 32-acre plot during the fall of 1968. At latest report, the grasses are coming along fine. Then agronomists turn their attention to the planting of thousands of seedling trees as the next step in the program that will determine what species of trees will grow best. Seedlings from a nursery set the wheels in motion for the planting of 14,000 small trees in the spring of 1969. Planters work systematically to get the job done. Under the influence of the area's abundant moisture and favorable climate, the rehabilitation program will restore the land to productive purpose. A year after the trees are planted, foresters report growth is good. A power company agriculturalist checks trees in the test area and finds the test plots are supporting new vegetation. Meanwhile, steel is going higher at the plant and construction milestones are recorded. The steel skeleton for the first generating unit reaches skyscraping heights and is topped out. 
steel workers work atop the huge boiler structure. And cranes perform the lifting tasks and interesting patterns are formed against the sky. Anyone want this job? Another milestone, the arrival of a 210-ton steam drum sparks activity at the site. Operation of the boiler system depends upon precision sighting of the unit near the top of the boiler structure. The job of hoisting the drum must be performed carefully. Slowly, steadily, the unit is raised and positioned and joined by another to eventually collect steam from the boiler and feed it to the turbine unit that will whirl the power generator. At the end of 1969, four steel beams stretch across the top of the boiler cavity. From them will be suspended 162 miles of steel pipe in which water will be boiled to steam. The project is on schedule for a September 1971 startup for the first 700,000 kilowatt unit. Steam electric power plants are not new. 80% of the nation's electric power is produced in big plants like this one that Pacific Power operates in Wyoming. This hauler is typical of rigs that transport the coal from the mine to the crushing equipment in the field. The coal is dumped into a hopper and crushed. At the plant, it moves by means of an efficient coal handling system along a conveyor to be crushed to a smaller size. At this point, it can be stockpiled or fed to a final pulverizer inside the plant, which grinds the coal to a fine powder. It is then blown into the combustion chambers. High pressure steam spins the turbine generators and electricity is produced to be used at the same instant many miles away. The big Pacific power plant is undergoing expansion for a third time and when boosted to a total of 750,000 kilowatts capacity in 1972, it will have about one half the capacity as the fully developed Centralia steam electric plant. The same type systems will be used at the Centralia project. Above Centralia, it is easy to see that construction of this West Coast giant is no overnight venture. It is the first in a series of large thermal electric plants scheduled by the Pacific Northwest Joint Power Planning Council. The second will be the Trojan Nuclear Power Plant on the Lower Columbia River near Rainier, Oregon, sponsored by Portland General Electric Company, Pacific Power, and the Eugene, Oregon Water and Electric Board to be in service in 1974. This complex of steel and concrete and pipelines taking shape to form the Centralia project means many things to the economy of the area. It means nearly 1,000 men on the payroll at the construction peak in 1971. A payroll that will average six million dollars annually over a three-year period. Permanent jobs for 265 men and women who will take home nearly three million dollars each year. Anyone who wants to view the construction work is invited to use a public viewing deck located at a point overlooking the project. This is the view of the steam electric plant from the lookout point above the Hannaford Valley. When this sketch becomes reality in 1972, transmission circuits of the Northwest Power Pool will transport the energy from the plant to load centers of the region, and coal-fired electric power will be ready at the flick of a switch to work for the industrial growth of the region and the comfort and convenience of thousands of people in their homes, farms, stores, and offices.